Um, hello, everyone. Um, so sorry about the noise. <laughs> um, and it's so great to see you all here. Again, I want to thank the church. Um, it's such an honor to uh, serve as a board member on the church itself. But I do want to also acknowledge that all of the proceeds from this evening's event go towards Ma's house. So it's outstanding that you're all here. It's a sold out event. And we're just so grateful for all of your presence, all of your listening. Uh, this isn't something that happens often, um, nor does it happen historically. The idea of um, people in the Hamptons, people on the East End, uh, listening to Indigenous people. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, I'm also going to just give each of us an opportunity to uh, do our own greetings, do our own introduction to who we are, um, why we're here. Um, again, my name is uh, Jeremy Dennis. I'm from the Shinnecock Nation, about 25 minutes um, west of here. And I am the lead artist of Ma's House. Um, I am also the facilitator of the residency. And we're so happy and honored that uh, Nanny Chekhon has been with us for about 12 days so far, um, with about eight days left of her residency. So um, Nanny, I'll pass it on to you if you want to do any greetings or introduction. Okay. Ha ha. Yay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Nanaba Chakon. I'm, I'm Diné from Navajo Nation, Chinle, Arizona. Um, my clan is Toda Chitney, if there's any other Diné out here. <laughs> um, I'm happy to meet all of you and always happy um, to share presence and space with new people. I am I'm based out of Albuquerque, so definitely a long way from home. And I am a full-time artist, I'm a painter, I do large-scale painting, murals, and a lot of those pieces are community-engaged work. So as a public works artist, the majority of the work that I make, um, I feel like I can't take full credit of it entirely because it's always created with an aspect of people, other people, and recognizing the spaces, recognizing the people, recognizing the land that the work itself resides in. It's always in conversation with it. And maybe that's a good place to just kind of jump into this and talk about how we met, which I think is part of that process um, of creating the work that I make. I had began making work as a public works artist um, because I deeply feel that we should have agency in our communities. Um, we should see ourselves in our communities. We should have ownership of that. It's part of um, also self-determination. I think that so many spaces, so much of the colonized la landscape really seeks to erase people. It really seeks to privatize people um, and create an elitism that divides us apart instead of bringing us together. And one of the few ways that we can abolish that, one of the few ways that we can bring people together is with art. Um, it happens, it's a language that we all understand and can use to communicate. Um, during the pandemic, me and two other artists, uh, like Wanunya Wire and Tatiana Falalisteda, um, were asked to create a very, very unique piece given in our process. They are also community engaged public works artists, muralists. They all have different facets in their own practice, but we can all paint, we can all paint really big, <laughs> and we all enjoy creating that work and having um, the inception of that work happen with people. Um, that it doesn't start with our own ideas, that it really starts by conversations and bringing people together. Um, so we did that. We um, were, oh, good timing. <laughs> okay. um, so at, at the time, we were asked to, to embark on this project um, with MoMA PS1, and it was really kind of given to our own design. Um, it was, you know, they, get, they gave us the reins on, on, you know, we're interested in abolishing this wall that's in front of the museum. And, 
you know, providing a space for community to have conversation, and that's exactly what we do um, as artists and how we facilitate work. So we began working locally with um, two Queens-based groups and really started it from this question of we are at this like very pivotal moment um, being that at the time of this project like it was during lockdown it was kind of like to take you back to that moment um, there was kind of a lot of fear a lot of division but also kind of this moment of a lot of change a lot of hope a lot of um, on the ground people working together finding finding their own facets of small communities, um, maybe letting go of some. Um, really a change of, I wanna say like a, a, a zeitgeist through, through the world. Um, and so we, we talked to people in this idea of sovereignty, of how people were creating ideas of sovereignty to create a better world. Like what were they doing within their own facets, within their own communities, within their own groups of people to really change and to take agency of that change. And one of the groups was um, Transform America, which was a <coughs> self-organized group in Queensbridge projects. Um, the other one was is a immigrant rights group and advocacy group called Make the Road. And with that, we also invited members of Shinnecock and Matinecock Nation to, enjoy, to join in these conversations. And each of these conversations um, were really about people recognizing that it's essential to recognize your own, at this time, that the thing that was gonna pull us through wasn't reliance on government. It wasn't reliance on whatever our cities were gonna provide. It was really reliance on each other. And coming together and imagining that together, taking a moment to like audaciously dream together, which is where the conversations led. Um, oops. There's kind of one of our uh, community meetings and you know, taking the time to draw together, taking the time to conversate, to really create a space that anything could be said, anything would be heard, and to transform those ideas into um, basically like a 200-foot mural. <laughs> um, Jeremy, when we had, it, it was interesting and essential to bring up this conversation and include the indigenous voices of New York and Shinnecock Nation was very interesting because um, I think that a lot of the times when we're in New York and with land acknowledgements, everybody you know, wants to acknowledge the immediate people of um, the territories that they're on. But a big misnomer is how much indigenous people were everywhere and moved throughout different landscapes and the same thing happens for me back home. You know, it becomes this compartmentalization and this kind of governance of land division, but really people shared in the land. Um, and when people say that like, you know, we don't own the land, the land owns us, it's very much true. And um, there was a burial rock in, in Queens, kind of on far Queens, and when I had looked it up and had known about it belonging to Shinnecock, um, it, it was interesting to me because I was like, wow, it's like way out there. But then what an interesting conversation to have about that space and that time and really bringing in the idea of space and time um, across landscape like that. So um, that was, of course, when I had met uh, well, when we really brought um, that group into, into the conversation. Jeremy, since we couldn't travel so far because it was pandemic time, um, we had invited Jeremy and had gotten introduced to Jeremy from some of his family members. And 
saw his work and was like blown away and gave him directions to take some photos of a, for, for this project. And they were just like dead on and absolutely stunning. <laughs> and we were like, this is like exactly what, this is exactly what we've been talking about. This is exactly what we've been thinking of and dreaming. Um, and so this project ended up, um, because of the complications of this time and kind of, it ended up kind of spanning across three years. Um, and because of the complications of just the time and, and the, the enormity of this project, we were only able to produce this first part, but are currently in the process of um, raising funding to complete the rest of it. So that is an important part of community engaged work that I think needs to always be talked about and said is that it's not just the vision it's of the artist it's not just the creation of the artist or or um you know it doesn't live singularly you can't take it off the wall in one month when the show is finished um there's a time and a process and it's really a gift and a conversation piece for the community created by the community so the work was living before this and it um, has to kind of finish that conversation in entirety. So we're looking for a different location to um, put it up. <clears throat> um, well, I had a very small um, involvement in the whole process. So <laughs> I, I was attending a couple of Zooms, I was giving some feedback, and um, I do also want to acknowledge um, my older sister, Kelly. Um, she just Yay. walked through the door. That's the subject of the mural. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Yeah, um, Kelly's just so amazing. And actually, during the commission and production of this mural, she was a, a second ever a female elected trustee of Shinnecock. So it's that whole idea of um, burning down everything, rebuilding in a new, more beneficial way. And so I, I really wanted to ask, especially in terms of figurative work and working with um, living subjects, how do you um, account for accountability itself? Um, how do you know like what to include? Like what's the end point? Um, and also just the idea of, well maybe I'll, I'll save this for the second question, I'll start there. Yeah, um, I'm gonna answer this as myself, but I feel in working with Tatiana and Lenny, one of the, reasons, one of the things that we really agreed on before we could even work as collaborators is what was our intention as being working with community. And we all agreed that community keeps us accountable. Um, it's not necessarily about our, it, it really is a moment of putting your ego aside, um, taking the time to listen, taking the time to research, taking the time to have sensitivities to, to what should be there, what should, what, what this community is gonna have to live with and what the response of it is gonna be. And thank you for introducing your sister so eloquently and beautifully because Kelly, when we had chosen to put Kelly on this piece, it was really that. Um, a common thread through a lot of the conversations we had were about how we are at this pivotal time of letting things go, of shedding, you know, of under, I mean, there was all of these museums and institutions and colleges and, um, you know, that were kind of doing these solidarity statements and, you know, wanting to really look for change. And I think that through, um, through a lot of, of people of color, we were definitely feeling that. We were saying like, you know, this, this is a moment of, this is almost the peak and we can see the other side. What is that other side gonna look like? And maybe that a chance of such radical change is such a, a moment of pivotal change, of scary change, of maybe the ideas of destruction. I think that those, we definitely saw, we saw that acted out in real life, but what does it mean? Do you continue down that path of destruction or is it an opportunity to flourish in a different way? And everybody was for, this needs to, 
this needs to end so something else can grow. Um, and that became a theme throughout it. And at the time, seeing Kelly was, and the reason we had chosen her was, this is the embodiment of somebody who is that act of change. This is a young woman who is a lawyer who is um, on counsel in her own nation. Um, whoops, um, recognizing recognizing nations, recognizing indigenous people, not as like Indian people or as you know native people, but that we are each sovereign nations with our own government, our own people, our own ideas, our own <laughs> government, all of these things, our own land. Um, all these little tiny, all these nations inside, inside, of, inside of the United States. Um, she is that act of change, she is that person. And I think that in putting portraiture on a wall, a lot of the work that I do in my, this of course um, was a collaboration piece. And we wanted to show actual people in their community who were making the act of change. Um, to make it like a monument, to make it like uh, a monument, but also monumental. Um, but in my own work, a lot of the times I refrain from doing actual portraits of people because people always are like, who is that? You know, who, who's that? And, and they want to attach it to some, something. So to really highlight people in their communities who were the symbol and who were these, this um, people of active change were really what we wanted to do. Hmm. And she was really part of that. Well, um, speaking of people and um, identifiable representation, I want to transition to your next um, current project. Um, this is combining art and technology. It's interactive. Um, you can actually touch the wall, and it'll um, play a tune. It'll play um, like a, a spin. Um, well, how, how would you describe the sounds that come through these different panels? Yeah, so um, all of the work that I create is the majority, I want to say the majority of the works that I make are all public art pieces, um, probably about 80% of them. Um, about another 80% of those public art pieces are always created in tandem with different people in the community. This one is no different. This one is really dif different from a lot of the work that I've created in the past. Um, the elements that are always remain constant throughout my work that I create is that it's in conversation with the space that it resides and that it's in conversation with the people. So this work is actually very experimental. It's, it's a sound piece. Um, I created it with a group of students that I've been working with for a couple of years and also two scientists, <laughs> two computer scientists, and um, we got a, a Carnegie Mellon grant to create this work and to work on this project, the development of these pieces. And it's really about the combination between art and technology and kind of to demystify it in a lot of ways. When I, when I got to get, my collaborator is Leah Buckley and Alicia Bustos, and on the science side of it. And we really had long conversations about demystifying and breaking down the barriers between the art world and the science world, and also like with the public, that there is this like kind of untouchable area. We, when we think about science, when we think about computer science and the leading of computer science, we think about, we don't think about teenage girls <laughs> um, in Albuquerque creating this, you know? And when, when we think about art, sometimes we don't think about art as being something that you can touch and manipulate and that you become as essential to that piece as the person who created it. So really we wanted to create these pieces that were interactive and that were reliant on the audience to, to interact and exchange with that work. Um, really, really different, and it's kind of led me into this path of doing abstract work, which is very different because I do a lot of figurative work. Um, but here's my students doing, uh, yeah, learning, learning to build circuits with the, the um, material that we use. This piece, I'm just going to go back a little bit, 
It's made entirely out of copper, copper paneling, um, also conductive copper paint and carbon paint. And basically the entire work itself is the entire work itself is, acts like a microchip. Um, it's a programmable work designed specifically for this space. And this, the work itself um, is about collective healing. Um, it resides in the National Hispanic Cultural Center, which is in downtown Albuquerque. And that building was created in reference to Mesoamerican Mayan Aztec architecture. And the idea of that architecture, um, not necessarily the Hispanic Cultural Center, was really made to create acoustic sounds and to reverberate sounds. And those sounds were used during gatherings, during ceremonies, and looking at the idea of sound, the way that we talk to each other, the vibrations that we feel around us, um, is something I'm very, very interested in and in how we're affected by that. Um, we're, we have so much sound pollution. We have so much um, things that are kind of in our atmosphere. And it's ancient technology, ancient knowledge that the reverberation of those sounds made us feel a certain way. They healed us. They actually physically healed us. Um, it's why we feel good when we play music. It's why we feel good when we chant and when we hum. Um, or can hear a drum kind of, you know, go out. So we studied frequencies and the effects of frequencies. And this mural, when touched, um, whoops, wrong way. Um, sounds different frequencies for healing. So can you do this? Do it again? For sounds, so let's. <laughs> to come up and play with them and try playing maybe like like having one person touch one and then having another person touch one like maybe a few seconds oh, we won't go with all that <laughs> <laughs> got a little teachy there for a minute but yeah basically um a lot of the design and understanding the design of this piece and the intention of working with students in it is also to understand that like our first instinct in creation is also to play. So in this work, that there's a lot of design that's physical, there's a lot of design that relies them to actually see what this feels like to create this, what kind of movements, um, the way that you would work and play or use this work collectively. Um, it's in the progress. When I get back to Albuquerque, it'll be something that will be finished. Um, each t we've done three pieces like this. This is the third one. And um, not that sound. Each of them have different components and capabilities. Um, this one, I think, is like we're finally gelling together <laughs> and finding a process together um, with this work. Um, and that's, yeah, go ahead. Was, was the um, next slide your painting slide? Yeah, just a painting. Uh, well, I'm a little curious about, um, I have to find a good one to use. Uh, on the bottom. <laughs> um, I really wanted to ask a little bit about your um, current experience at Mom's House. So you've been here for uh, <laughs> Do you want to use this? Yeah, why don't we share one okay. instead? Thank you. Um, I really wanted to ask about your current experience at Ma's House. So you've been at Ma's House for 12 days um, on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. You've been inspired by the land, a little bit of the tours, a little bit of the everyday experience being there. 
Um, I know that you've also been going to Cooper's Beach and every other beach as much as you can every single day. And so water has become the subject matter of your current body of work, which is uh, painting. Um, I also want everyone to remember before you leave, there's a couple of examples of Nanny's work on the back right wall. But can you just talk a little bit about why water now? Um, what is it about water? And how do you fathom, um, as an artist, approaching this massive topic? Cool. Uh, can you guys hear me? We're going to have like a pile of microphones <laughs> up, here, up here by the end of the night. Um, yeah, so uh, the other side of my work, that the, the other 20%, uh, is that I paint. I have studio work. And this is this is just a, uh, a just to give you some examples. I'm I also do lar very large scale paintings, a lot of them figurative. Um, I have been creating work um, that's really been a, a deep dive for me into Diné creation stories and understanding my responsibility and legacy to that oral tradition and kind of confronting that oral tradition in a way, in a, in, for myself, knowing that I am not a Diné speaker. Um, to be indigenous and not know your own language, I think that is one of, it's one of the ways colonization won. Um, and I think it's the hardest the hardest truth, it's the hardest pill to swallow because you, lo you lose so much. You lose, you know, your songs, you lose your ceremonies, you lose so much, but it doesn't deny who I am and my history and who my people are. Um, and so I began to ask myself, how do I carry that on? And I carried it on through my own language, which is painting. And so this is, this is um, an excerpt from that. And why water now? I like that, I like that slogan. Um, <laughs> but uh, like a year ago or something, I was out on my res and was out, I, I'm out in Chinle and there's a lot of canyons through there. And I found a seashell, fossilized seashell, and it was really cool. And it just uh, made me start daydreaming and thinking about, because I was on top of a, of a mesa, um, and there's no water out there. There's, it, it doesn't rain at all. And all of those canyons, you know, we have the knowledge, we understand that all of those canyons, all of the, the, the way that that landscape was carved out was from water at one time. And, so I began to think about my own relationship with water and really began to think about when I come to contact with water the most. And when I do, it's like, you know, like this. And it's in water bottles. And I think about the preciousness and the sacredness of water. And I think about the things that I want to protect for myself. Um, in this world, and one of them is water. We need water. And I also began to have this conclusion of like, how can I have any kind of radical stance? How can I be radical um, if I don't fully understand the nature of something? How can, I, how can I be at the core of something and want to protect it, want to understand it, want to be it, when my only um, interactions with that element, with that thing, are through a colonized existence. So um, I wanted to seek out what water is and understand it in my own language. And so began to find like untamed places of water. And one of the places that came to mind were, um, were, were here. Um, I had visited Ma's house uh, when I was working on the PS1 mural, and I thought, wow, this is such a gift, like such a gift. Like, thank you, thank you, Shinnecock Nation, for like not developing those shores, 
not fencing in things, for providing space for the ocean to breathe. And um, it was just really, really special. And I thought, I want to come back here and draw it. <laughs> so um, one of the places of vulnerability for me as an artist, I always start even these massive paintings as drawings. Um, I'm a big drawer and obsessed with the line. The line is definitely, I feel like there's, there's, I always say like to students, like there's no lying a line. You know, your, li your line is it's there, it's kind of naked, it's exposed, but it can say so much. Um, but a lot of my process as a painter is like understanding the way that I do, I feel has become very systematic, it's become very process oriented, I know what I'm doing, and really just wanted to find a place of vulnerability again. Um, in so many different ways, uh, step away from the process that I know, find something new again, experiment, and uh, sit and draw water. So I, I've been doing that. I've been kind of sitting and 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 drawing, taking <laughs> taking taking a backpack full of you know little cups and pads and you know started with marker out here I actually did something that I've never done before and found this black paper and white ink which is really really beautiful and I really like it and I brought some it was really hard guys so only tell me nice things <laughs> no just kidding you guys, I don't care um, but no I was like oh, am I ready for this <laughs> So all these art people, I've got to show it now. Um, no, it's just a very, very big place of vulnerability um, to try something new. And also to be in a place to um, just as like an experience that I think I've seen come through my line is um, to sit in front of an ocean where there's nobody else around. And you know the ocean is temperamental. It's some days it's calm, and some days it's crazy, and some days it's wild. And to realize that like it could just steal me, you know, it could just I'm just out here, and nobody <laughs> would know. And the ocean is so vast, and it was very, very humbling and very, very scary. And I realized it's because, you know, I, I've only known a tamed water. I've only known a water that's tame. And um, so yeah, so it's, it's, that's what I've been working on. And for these pieces, um, yeah, this, was, this, is, this is down a, at the residency, and I just love it. I see it, and I'm like, <laughs> um, um, I could provide context for these. Um. I would love, I would love to hear <laughs> that. Yeah, I know you told me a little bit, but I would, I would love to hear it more. Um, well, since uh, 2016, um, Shinnecock has been invited each year to participate in the 4th of July uh, parade, to have a guest float in the Shinnecock parade, or, or the uh, Southampton parade. And in 2016, we finally had enough of um, paying to go to our local Cooper Beach. We've been um, able to access that for thousands of years for free. Um, Shinnecock, after all, translates to people of the stony shore, so it's part of our identity, it's part of where we belong. And so uh, tribal members ended up using that opportunity to raise awareness. We created a whole float around um, beach back protest. <laughs> and um, ever since then, since 2016, we go out each summer as a, a massive protest. We try to create awareness of the fact that we still have to pay. And um, hopefully I'm not uh, wrong in saying this, but um, the handful of people that live in Southampton Village they get to go for free as a privilege for living there, and we have to pay for the summer permit or $50 a day to access the same beach. So um, there's so many different things that we're trying to do. Um, this might be, uh, based on the beautiful handwriting, a piece by my mother, Denise Silva Dennis, is in the back. <laughs> so she is a um, art teacher, so um, I believe that's one of her pieces, but during uh, last summer, um, we actually created about a dozen of these posters, and ended up in the news trying to create that awareness. So water is something that is always on mind. It's um, so potent. And I'm so glad that you're working on water as subject matter. Thank you. Yeah, so so we'll see how it goes. Um, 
I guess in a long, long-term goal of this project or maybe this idea of work is I, I, I'm curious to go, you know, when I do enough of these, um, because they're all different, they're all in the moment, but then to go back home and look at the striations on the canyon and see if those striations match a memory. So. And so you have um, about a week. Oops. Ooh. <laughs> oh, well, well, that's a great one. <laughs> um, so I think um, Talina put them on auto rotate. So okay. we'll just be going through as we speak. But um, you also have a upcoming major solo show in California. Do you want to talk a little bit about if these pieces might potentially be involved in that or what you have planned? Yeah, no, these, these are studies. Um, I don't think these exact pieces will be there. Um, but I do hope to de use a portion of this work to develop into the pieces that are there. Um, I am also... You know, I'm invested in how these stories also relate back to lands, I mean, how water and how the idea of water relates back to landscape and re relates back to our creation stories. I feel like that's just part of that series of work that I'm also still explaining and still discovering and still working on. So I think that there'll be elements of it. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll have a solo exhibit, a solo show at Tim Hawkinson's gallery, just to kind of give it a little plug here, um, in Los Angeles, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, I think it's going to be beautiful and interesting, and definitely will have elements of some of these abstract works, and then also um, some of the other pieces that I'm known for doing. Um, well, we do have about um, 10 minutes left of the artist talk, but I do want to open it up for the audience to ask if there's any questions. Um, please just raise your hand, and if you can speak up, um, that'd be appreciated, or I can also walk out as well. Um, I don't mind. Mic <laughs> 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 number. I can just ask a question. Okay. That's okay. I'm sure you can hear me. Thank you very much for coming, and Jeremy, doing the work you do being on our board. Thank you so much. Um, you were born in Gallup, is that right? Yeah. And then how long did you spend much of your time in Gallup or mostly in Albuquerque? <laughs> this is always like for some reason an interesting area of confusion. So out on, out in, I was raised in Chinle, Arizona. Um, it, at the time there wasn't a hospital in Chinle. So yeah, so Gallup is like an hour and a half away from Chinle. Um, same thing with my brother. I have a brother who's an artist, and he was born in Fort Defiance, but we grew up in Chinle. <laughs> so I, I'm not from Gallup. I was just born there. Like, just a night. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you know we spent a lot of time in Silver City. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and then um, it, as, when we when I was young, I grew up in Chinle, and then we moved to Albuquerque. So you know, through through my like adolescence years, lived in Albuquerque. But my mom's family is from that way. So I always like I always make the joke. Um, stop me if you've heard this before, but that I was born that I'm from. Chinle, Albuquerque, and I-40, because <laughs> like we go, we've gone back pretty much my entire life between both places. And my last question is that first mural that you spent a lot of time telling us about, mm -hmm. so beautiful. Is that a photograph that you took, Jeremy? Yeah. Is that you in the picture? Me? Yeah. No, it's Jeremy's sister Kelly. In the that is your sister. In the picture. Yeah. The first one is um, it's at MoMA PS1, and it's currently there now. Yeah, it's in the entry foyer. Oh, so, mm -hmm. uh, oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Incredible. I just wanted to ask how the protest is going about access to the beach. Um, What's well, uh, another great question? Thank you. Um, well, July is sort of the peak of summer here in the Hamptons, so 
Um, if you're not already following on Instagram and social media, there's a page called Warriors of the Sunrise, and that's a page that does a lot of awareness, activism, protest. It's um, largely uh, cousin Becky Jenia, um, Tila Troge. Um, my family is also largely involved. But sometime in mid-July, we'll probably have to do another protest. Um, we do have tribal IDs. We're a federally recognized tribe. That would be an easy solution. So if anyone knows any Southampton Town supervisors or <laughs> the mayor, um, we, we do have the solutions. We just have to pass the rule or make the vote happen. Hashtag beach back. <laughs> Hashtag beach back. <laughs> well, that's my question, too. What, do you, what can everyone here do to help you? Because, like, a specific way, like, do we all write, do you want everyone here to write letters? Um, that's a form of um, making change, for sure, but um, we at Mama's House, we bring in artists like Nanny to highlight and elevate these issues in ways that, um, I, I believe art has that power to um, bring people together who normally wouldn't agree or see eye to eye. So um, that's one way. Um, writing to the town hall, of course, is another way. But just keeping pressure and letting people know that we do care, that this is something that's important. So I think that's the best way. Um, I was interested uh, to ask you about um, the generosity of 80% of your practice being kind of community-based and um, uh, public facing. Um, when did that sort of dawn on you as something that you really wanted to do? And was there a sort of moment when that uh, generosity came to the forefront? Yeah. Um, so I, I began making art in general. My, my first inclination to make art was as a graffiti artist. And so I've always, always made art publicly. I learned how to make art publicly. Um, and I learned how, what that reaction was. Um, I learned what that felt like to have a response, a communal response, not only from graffiti community, but from the, the otherwise public. And also realized my own agency like, really, I, I, f I feel like that was um, just something that really empowered me as like a young, young brown woman and really showed me like, I can put my mark here and no one can tell me no. And that mark says something. Um, it says something to my peers and it says something to that lady coming out of the grocery store and it says something to the police. And, um, and I, li I loved it. <laughs> uh, I, I really, I, I mean, that's, that's what made me find, find a language to speak in. And as I got older, um, I, never, I never lost that. I never lost that drive to make work in that way. Um, it just felt more appropriate to share that and to expand that. And, um, and I'm also, you, there's only so much you can take of yourself. You know, like, <laughs> I'm more interested because it's more interesting to me to, to, to learn about people, learn about spaces. Um, I'm fascinated by that. There's the piece, but there's also a process. And in that process, it's, it's, it's a beautiful interaction. It's something that motivates me. It's something that keeps me curious. So I, I enjoy those aspects. Hi. Hi. Okay, great questions. Love them. I, I have one myself, just real quick. This was actually on behalf of somebody else who's here. Um, with regard, the, a question I was asked to ask, which is a formal question really about the technique of being a large format muralist and working in the public. Um, how exactly is a painting that is 200 feet constructed? Like, is there projection? Is there a grid system? Like, how do you actually get it done? Because you've done it not only in PS1, I think people should know this is a regular thing of yours. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's, a lot, uh, there's some big ones. Um, 
it, it, I want to say all of that. <laughs> like, every wall is different. Every surface is different. Um, yeah, I mean, scale it, just draw it. Um, sometimes if the conditions are right, um, it's not a sketchy neighborhood, you could project it. Uh, you know, there, there's all, all sorts of, all sorts of things that you can do. I am, the, the transition between graffiti and murals, I actually took on sign painting at one time, had a really terrific mentor. And he used to paint billboards, and it used to just blow my mind like that at one time billboards were hand painted. And um, he taught me a lot. Of, like, I mean, there's tricks. There's so many tricks. There's the next artist talk or something. <laughs> the tricks of making a mural. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'd say all of them. You, you got to do all of them. Every wall is different, you never know what's going to happen. You mentioned your regret about not knowing your um, your indigenous language. Is that is there a reason? Is it not accessible? Is there um, is that available to you to still learn? Of course, every, everyone can always still learn. I could I could still learn. Um, is it harder? Is it you know? It, I I think that it's a different level of commitment. Um, it's easy to say, yeah, I should learn something, and then you actually have to do it. You have to commit to it. Um, I mean, there's native speakers around still, which is very fortunate. I think that there's a lot of nations, a lot of people that don't have access to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could. I could, I could very much commit my life to that. I do think it's not as easy as just like picking up a book though. It's really about immersion. It's really about going back and finding that. And yeah. And Some, it's relatable. So most of us are immigrants. And so right. Like what you said was so relatable. So I was just wondering, as someone who goes to the powwow every year. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I want to ask about the mural of you with you. Um, like stylistically, that, that treatment of light and volume and vision. Um, it, it, you know, maybe you regard it as kind of a global tradition, but it, it has a heritage, right? It has an ancestry that goes back to the Mediterranean and the European peninsula. Like, I, I wonder if there's, if you're using that uh, sort of as an instrument, or, or if is there some feeling with mm. using the language of the colonizer, right? right, right. In painting. I, I'm always interested in that. I mean, you're, you're right. As a painter, as like somebody who paints, you are carrying on like a European tradition of painting. But aren't we speaking in English also? <laughs> like, living on colonized land and like all of these other things. So um, it, our, the intention of the work and its aesthetics, its media aesthetics are always, I think for us in a mural is to be read immediately. And the lighting, um, the dramatic kind of feel and um, of that painting was really us wanting to make a glow, almost more cinematic than I would say, like, um, than like classical painting, European painting style. I don't think any of us were like, let's make it look like, you know, I don't know, some old painting. Um, we, were, we were interested in, in the dramaticism of light and fire and the idea of, having that dramatic lighting on the face, having a dramatic, having that glow being kind of the essence of hope, but also maybe that glow of something that you're kind of like looking at, at, at the like leftover destruction. 
So we were, we were really interested in, in that like strong, definite lighting choice, and, and that's where we, we made that from. Okay, so this is a question for both of you. Um, speaking about mentorship and seeking that, how, has, how have both of you found mentorship as a younger person or artist or still in your, your practice? And um, how has that affected your practice? Um, well, I can go first since my mom's sitting right there. <laughs> um, so my mom, um, I've been learning more and more recently in the last few years the trajectory of her artistic career and the fact that she also wanted to be a photographer at a time, uh, an acrylic painter as a artistic career. And um, she also had an experience with mentors who taught her the techniques, taught her everything you need to know to be an artist, but at the end of the day said that because you're a woman, because you're native and you're not doing basketry or you're not doing uh, ceramic bowls, your art won't go anywhere. So that's a reality that just one generation before me but my mom instilled into me that it's possible. She gave me the motivation. My dad isn't an artist, but he also motivated me. So having that mentorship really um, allowed me to go forward as a child. And then I was very lucky each step of the way from college to grad school to beyond just having different mentors who um, kind of gave me inspiration, hope, uh, guidance, and career paths. It's amazing. Um... Yeah, I, I think I, I've come from a long line of um, mentors and peers and collective learning. Uh, I didn't study art in school at, at all. I studied education. I, I was a teacher for like seven years before I decided to transition and just be a full-time artist. Um, so everything was like, you know, just finding folks and being like, wow, and being inspired and obsessed <laughs> and um, just kind of pulling at that, you know? And, and um, I, I always tell young students, you know, uh, be nice, be nice to folks. And, and learn from them because it'll take you a lot further <laughs> um, than probably anything else. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I was always just very, very interested in, in what people did as, I, I was, I mean, I was very fascinated when I saw people draw. So anybody that I felt like could draw good, I was like, wow. And then, you know, that went from like homeboys when I was growing up, who were you know doing pen pen and ink drawings, and and um, up until now, you know, when I find somebody, and I, I think that those inspirations and those mentorships have changed um, because I think now I I seek out people who have interesting ideas and interesting thoughts, you know, and I, I'm fascinated by by what. What, what they're bringing and what they're changing and the way that they're thinking and seeing the world. And that, that's definitely a mentorship too. I'm fascinated by Leah. Leah's definitely, a, she's a collaborator. This is uh, Alicia, but Leah's not in here, but it, this has been a really interesting project because it's really stretched my brain um, in thinking also about art as, as an imprint and creating that um, one of, one of a kind uniqueness in a microchip. Um, well, I want to thank you, Nanny. I want to thank the church. I want to thank everyone that's here. This was such a beautiful program, historic. Um, I can't say thank you enough, so um, appreciate you all coming. <laughs> yeah.